Now, when I started medical school, I heard a lot of scary truths about med school and my future as a doctor. Now, fast forward almost 10 years, some of those truths were actually bold faced lies and others were right on the money. Let's break them down. Hey friends, welcome back to the channel here at the MD Journey where we make content to help you succeed on your medical journey, but doing it with less stress. Now, a few weeks ago, I asked you guys on Instagram through a poll of some misconceptions and the myths that you may have heard about on the medical journey before you actually started. Went through those and I thought they were awesome. So we're gonna go ahead and compile all of them and put them into four major categories and break down which were true and which were absolutely bogus. And the four categories of myths that we're gonna explore include lifestyle, intelligence, happiness, and the medical journey itself. So first, starting with lifestyle, our first statement that we're gonna break down truth versus myth is that all doctors are wealthy and have a glamorous lifestyle. Now, after going through my own medical journey and being an attending for a year and now going back to fellowship and also experiencing the lifestyles of my various attendings that I worked with, this is actually 100% a myth. Now, first, let's get this clear. Doctors make good money here in the US. You can guarantee yourself a six-figure income and vary on the spectrum between anywhere from 150 to $200,000 to significantly higher, depending on the specialty that you pick. But it's not a lack of income that makes this concept a myth. Instead, you have to think about things such as lifestyle creep, the high amount of student loan debt a lot of these doctors will graduate with and start to build up on an interest, especially if they trained in the more expensive parts of the country, private schools, Northeast, West Coast, those tend to be a lot more expensive. And then you start to just have high cost of living. And then if you combine those things with living in a higher cost of living area, the West Coast, the East Coast, then you may be in a situation where yes, you make good money, but you may be spending a lot of it just for your normal living expenses in the areas that you live in. Now, is this true for all doctors and all specialties? Absolutely not. You can be in a high demanding field such as plastic surgeries in the West Coast, where you can be making very good money just because of the demand that comes with cosmetic plastic surgery, for example, or you can just be really good at your craft and be one of the few that can do something and thus basically dictate a revenue that comes from that. And on the flip side, you have doctors who are much more focused instead of maximizing the revenue on how much they're actually saving. Think about all of the audience members that are following blogs like the White Coat Investor, myself included, who are very focused on increasing the amount of money that they're saving, increasing the amount of the money that they're investing, and keeping their cost of living as low as possible for wherever they're living. As a reference, when I was working one year as a hospitalist, I was making about $250,000 to $280,000, and I saved about 67% of that money after tax to do things like buy the house that we ultimately live in. So is it possible for a doctor to be wealthy? Absolutely. Is it possible for a doctor to have a great lifestyle? Yes. But you have to define what that looks like for you and if it's feasible within your finances and where you're living and all the other cost of living things you have to consider. Statement number two, doctors have perfect work-life balance and autonomy of their schedule. Now this, my friend, is also a myth. I know in medical school, I was always looking to that finish line where I was an attending or an independent provider and I was making the six-figure incomes and I would have the lifestyle of a doctor. And then I realized that those guys are actually the busiest amongst them all. I thought I was busy as a med student. I see my attendings right now in fellowships who are taking calls early in the morning, who are on calls over the weekend, who are doing procedures throughout the day, notes and clinics, and trying to balance all the other logistical and admin stuff that you have to do for your job. And it seems quite hectic. It doesn't actually seem relaxed at all. And that's particularly true in those fields that you'd consider to be primary care. So think about family medicine, pediatrics, internal medicine. I have a good friend who is an internal medicine or family medicine physician. He has patients pools of his own, but he has a very busy clinic and often he's working on doing notes and logistics of patient cares into the weekend, even outside of the time that he is paid for it. For example, I have a very good friend who's a PCP or a primary care provider. He's really passionate about outpatient medicine. He loves taking care of his patients, but he has a busy patient pool, so busy clinic days, and often he's working into the weekends to finish notes and logistical things that he has to do for patients so they can get the best care possible. I'm sure no one was advertising the amount of notes and paperwork he would have to do into the weekends when he was considering that field as a career. And even myself as a cardiologist in training where I'll be a fully independent cardiologist in two years, I know I'm going to have a busy patient pool where I'm going to always have to navigate all the labs and studies that they're getting done and the requests and questions they have, plus any inpatient duties in addition to any admin duties. And I know that's not always going to fit in your perfect eight to five o'clock kind of normal clinic schedule that we always thought in medical school to exist. So work-life balance, can you make it work? Yes. You just have to understand that your work will likely bleed into other aspects of your life. And frankly, you have to either be okay with it or work less and change the roles that you're willing to take on. Now on the flip side, this is not true for every specialty in medicine. There are definitely doctors and the specialties of doctors that are more lifestyle friendly. For example, if you are in the field of dermatology, you tend to have a very heavy clinic schedule, but tend to not have weekends, tend not to have calls. Again, it depends on the group that you're working for, but those physicians seem to make very good money, have to enjoy the skin, but if they do, they seem to enjoy their jobs and they tend to have kind of a typical clinic schedule without always having a weekend obligation or a late night call that somebody in cardiology or surgery or any other field may have. So if those fields exist, you just have to enjoy them. I frankly don't. 
to want to do that. So those lifestyle friendly specialties definitely exist. You just have to make sure you actually enjoy the content and the work description that goes with it. Otherwise you're going to be miserable even though you're working less. Now, the next statement that we'll break down is that medicine guarantees job security and is a stable career path. Now for the most part, once you cross the chiasm of getting all your board exams, graduating medical school, getting a DO or an MD, getting into residency and finishing residency, that's a lot of steps. Once you get there, you have the ability to be a doctor wherever kind of area will take you. So if you're family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics trained, and you finish residency, you've gotten your licenses, you've passed your boards that you need to, again, lots of steps, you can find a job anywhere in the United States. Doesn't necessarily mean you will find a job in the city that you're looking for, the location, not necessarily, but that's not true for every job in the world anyways. So there's always going to be a need and job openings for those kinds of fields. Now on the flip side, one of the more unclear things about the medical journey is that if you're interested in something, there's usually an extra level of training you can do to become a little bit more specialized. And the assumption is, is that the more specialized you are, the more utilized you could be as an asset to a future employer. If you learn more tr trades as a surgeon, ideally you would be more useful for a hospital system to hire you. But if you become too specialized, the joke is, is that you know more and more about less and less until you know a lot about nothing. And the way that that can bite you in the butt is that if you're a highly specialized cardiologist, for example, and it's been some time since you've done the general aspects of things, if there's not a job description for exactly what you do and you either have to be okay with doing the more generalized version of what you essentially have now spend so much time doing something very specific on or you have to find a job in another city and I know that that's a problem in certain fields for example when I was considering to do radiation oncology in medical school I realized that at least in terms of residency I would not have a great say of geographic location of being close to family because it was so competitive most programs would only take two people per year and there's not a enough programs in my area where I felt comfortable saying this is the career path I want to do knowing that I'm going to have the same situation when I'm looking for a job in the future and if for some reason if I have to move or if I have to find another job then likely that means moving to a different city. So job security and having the flexibility is not always there for all fields but in terms of the more generalized on the spectrum so definitely those PCPs your general specialist um, you will be able to find a job and tend to be able to keep it for as many years as you want to work. Yes your job role and description will change as technology and medicine and problems and diseases become more frequent and less frequent, but does that mean that doctors will be go away or get laid off? Absolutely not. So job security definitely exists in medicine, but remember the more specialized and further down the pathway you go, the less flexibility you have to be able to make some changes. Next, we're gonna go into the category of intelligence. And the first statement that we're gonna break down is that medical school is only for straight A students. Now this myth is absolutely false. Now before you go into the flooding in the comments of saying, what do you mean you need this GPA and this MCAT score and these board scores to pass, you have to be smart and intelligent to do well in medical school. So you can't be somebody who has struggled academically all of your life and expect medical school to be significantly different. If anything, it's gonna be significantly worse just because the volume of material you'll be learning in the amount of time has just drastically increased. But do you have to be a straight A student? Absolutely not. Because frankly, first of all, you don't have to get straight A's to get and become a doctor. There are a lot of points that you're given to memorize details that don't necessarily impact patients' lives. Part of medical school is to teach you everything and then hope that you can use that information to make decisions about where you want to take care of patients. But even in that part, you are not always told that this is the most important thing you need to know to take care of the majority of your patients. In medical school, it is very common to get a lecture that is very intensely focused on things like an enzyme that affects one in two million people in case you see that disease, as it is to get a lecture that is intensely focused on one or two medications that you will commonly prescribe in a week or a month as a physician just because it's like something like hypertension and treating high blood pressure. But in medical school, you're not always Always told that this matters significantly less than knowing this. And what I was left with as a brand new medical student is just a lot of information. If you're somebody who is hardworking and you can put in the repetitions, which is really what medical school comes down to, you don't have to be a straight A student. You just have to know enough of those facts going into every exam, every quiz to do well enough to take to the next course. You can be a C student all the way through medical school and as long as you make it through graduation, you'll have the same credentials as the person who has graduated with 100 on every single quiz or test. And so if you're extremely passionate about taking care of patients, going 
going into medicine and making diagnoses and making management plans for patients, understand that the grades that you've had behind you may be a reflection of the things you need to change, but that doesn't mean that you are incapable of becoming a doctor. I was getting C's and B's my first semester in medical school. I thought that I was going to be incapable of being smart enough to do the things that I want to do now. But I realized that those were all misconceptions that I was frankly holding on to. I just needed to make some changes on how I studied. And once I was able to make those changes, I was able to see the grades and the retention that I ultimately wanted. Statement number two, I frankly love this one. Doctors know everything about every medical condition. Absolutely false. I wish I could have the intellect of some of those physicians from some of the medical dramas that come on TV like House, but frankly, that is not true. In fact, even in fields that I'm going into, so I'm a cardiologist by training, there are things that I always forget just because I haven't given myself enough repetitions. Medicine is completely about reps. You do tons of reps while you're learning through your PowerPoints and your slides and your syllabus and your book chapters in preparation for tests. And as a physician, it becomes even easier because your reps are your patients. Once you realize that these medications work better than this one to treat blood pressure, you start going for the right medications. Once you realize that these labs plus this patient history plus these complaints plus these vitals usually means that this diagnosis should be one, two, and three on my list, then you get better at making that diagnosis a lot quicker. Reps are really where the knowledge comes from. But again, if there's something that you don't see enough, you will know very little about it because the repetitions haven't come. Even if you had to memorize it for a board exam three years ago, you're likely not going to remember it now. But that's why medicine is built on so many available resources where I can quickly Google something using like essentially a medical encyclopedia of the dosage of a medication in case I've forgotten or a side effect or maybe what level of a lab I should be okay with to prescribe it versus saying maybe this is not the safest medication for you. So doctors by no means know everything about every medical condition. It is important to constantly be building on your learning environment so you're always improving and better able to take care of your patients and also come and do those repetitions to bolster the things that you are learning. But it's more important to be humble that you don't know everything about everything. So if a patient asks you, you have to be able to admit it, be able to look and understand where the best places to get your answers are from or people to get those answers from. Statement number three, doctors never make mistakes. Again, another myth. And the hope is, is that every time a patient comes into the room that you know exactly what to do with them, exactly the medication, the dosages, frequencies to follow with them, and more importantly, the way to communicate to that patient of saying, this is what I need you to do. Here are the side effects that you should be aware of. If X, Y, and Z happen, I need you to call my clinic, go to the emergency room, and have this perfect kind of knotted, bow-tied, cherry on top of communication that best takes care of the patient. But there are a lot of holes in the cheese wheels, you can imagine, where things can fall through. Maybe a patient doesn't understand. Maybe your physician didn't do a good job of communicating. Maybe the diagnosis wasn't correct. Maybe the medication was okay, but perhaps the side effect was more daunting to the patient. Maybe their labs interfered with the ability of a medication to work. There are so many factors in medicine and the body and the individual patient that you're taking care of where things can go haywire. And then of course, there are things that we never want, which is you make an error because you are not being attentive enough, or perhaps you were not following up enough, or perhaps, you know, you gave a medication to the wrong patient and didn't consider their other medications. There are so many mistakes that you can make in medicine and that is part of human nature and is also just part of how diligent you are with everything. So do doctors make mistakes? Yes. There are times where, for example, I have made mistakes based off of treating somebody for something like a fast heart rate in the hospital. There are common medications that we will go to to try to improve if somebody is going into heart rate of 150, their blood pressure is at the risk of going low. If I'm going to give them a medication, I know that this medication may help their heart rate, but at the same time, I also know that there's ability of that medication causing their blood pressure to drop. You have to pick the risks and benefits of those. For example, in my personal experience, I've made mistakes that I was aware that could be a possibility. For instance, I get called often when I'm on call, a patient's heart rate is exceedingly high. We need you to come to bedside and try to help improve it. If somebody's heart rate gets to the range of 150, 180, 200, as a physician, you have to do something to get that back into a normal rate so that way their heart has enough time to fill with blood and then pump out an adequate amount of blood. Otherwise, their blood pressure will drop patient will be confused and you're at risk of something really bad happening. Some of the medications that we'll go to in their back pocket to help with those also have side effects that we're aware of, such as it will bring their blood pressure down, which can cause a cycle of very dangerous things since you have to be aware of it. And so sometimes you give a patient with a hope that this medication will improve their heart rate and a nurse may call you saying, hey, their blood pressure is dropping. Would that be considered a mistake? Probably not be considered an adverse effect of that medication, but it requires the physician to be aware that that can be a possibility and know how to go ahead and tackle which medications to give, what 
to tell the nurses to do in those situations. And there've been tons of times where I fall into that situation where I made a decision and the decision either was not the right one for the patient or it was the right one and still we got an effect or an outcome that we didn't want. And being able to counteract it is really where the art of medicine comes. Now our last statement for this category is that doctors always have the final say in treatment plans. This is also 100% false. If you're a good doctor or health provider, you're always involving your patients, their families, whoever the decision makers are, as well as other specialists and consultants that would have some kind of role in that patient's care in your decision making. As a cardiologist, whenever I'm talking to a patient and or their families about medications or a diagnosis or procedures, ideally I hope that there's more than two or four sets of ears in that room so that way multiple people hear the same piece of information. In addition, before I even have that conversation, I tend to try to make sure I'm involving their medicine doctor, other specialists like their kidney specialist or their primary care doctors or other, if they have a cardiologist outside the hospital, we may call them first just to make sure that everybody's on the same page before I give my consensus that we need to do this procedure for you. This is what's going to happen X, Y, Z. And after all of that effort, a patient and their family may just say, I actually don't want to do any of the recommended things. I'd actually like to do the fourth or fifth recommended option on your list that you provided. And sometimes they have good reasons for it, or maybe sometimes they don't. You ultimately understand that the patient is the decision maker, not you as a physician. Myself as a physician is really not a decision maker. Instead, it's more of a health consultant for that patient where I present their information, my decision making, and then the best course of actions, as well as some backup options. If there are some, the patient with their decision makers will go ahead and come up with the best option for them. And once they do, it's just important for me that they understand that if it's not the most preferred option, that they understand the risks and benefits of that decision. And if I feel comfortable proceeding with it, then we all go forward. Now, the next category is happiness. And the first statement that we're going to break down is that medical school prepares you for the emotional toll of patient care. Now this statement personally, I actually consider to be true. Initially when I read this, I thought this would be a myth, but when I take a hindsight back in terms of patient care and emotional tolls that come with it, there's two aspects of patient care that causes emotional toll. One is the stress element of just the amount of hours that you have to deal with. And two is the amount of emotional toll that comes from getting bad news and dealing with the stresses of taking care of sick patients. The second one, medical school does a really good job of preparing you for. For example, where I did training for medical school, we had really good training on how to talk to family members and patients about bad news, how to tell patients about their prognosis, how to talk about like end of life care, do not resuscitate like decisions, and then simply how to do good care for sick patients. On the flip side, we also got a lot of volume exposure of how to take care of a lot of patients in the set amount of time. And with repetition, I got really good at it. Does it necessarily tell you how to manage your stress levels when you are like overblown and overworked? Maybe not. And I think certain medical schools may do that better or worse, but at least for my aspect, I got enough repetitions where I became really good at the patient volume, then I also became really good at talking those tough conversations. I know that's not the truth for every single person. Sometimes you may have no idea how to talk to sick patients. So at least from my personal journey, I would say true, but I won't be surprised in the comment section if you guys say, at least in your individual experiences, maybe that wasn't the case. And statement number two in this category is that doctors don't experience burnout or mental health issues, which 100% is false. There's definitely some highlight into the stress and the lack of mental well-being that comes into health providers and particularly in physicians. In fact, in 2024, Medscape released a physician burnout and depression report where 49% of physicians who were surveyed said that they were feeling burnt out and 20% even said that they were feeling depressed. Depending on the surveys that you look at, you actually will find physicians to be at the, one of the highest occupations at the risk of committing. And that just comes with all the stress that goes all the way from medical school, residency, and even being a full-time attending. It's due to all the things that we talked about, the high work volumes leading to lack of sleep, the high stress, just overall environment, the competitiveness, the finances that come with it, and then also the other reasons in your personal life that can cause excess stress. So unfortunately, both burnout and mental health issues are very common across physicians. It's ultimately why I created this channel so I could use my experience to share with you guys how to increase your chance of success while minimizing all that excess stress. And the final category that we're gonna break down is the medical journey itself. And the first statement that we're gonna break down is that you have to choose a medical specialty before entering medical school. This is 100% not true. In fact, I've made a video on the YouTube channel about all the specialties that I've considered, ultimately leading me down the path of being a cardiologist. If you guys are interested in that video, I'll go ahead and put it down in the description. But a big synopsis of that episode is that every experience made me feel like a certain specialty was going to be my dream job. And then the more that I would dive into there, I'd be like, actually, this is what I like about it. But the majority of these things I don't. And that would lead me to steer towards something else. I would have more of that one thing that I enjoyed. And then I would find other elements like diagnoses, management, screening medications, being the main medical driver of patient's care, ultimately leading me to internal medicine because I enjoy taking care of adults more than kids, ultimately leading me to cardiology because I enjoy heart related pathology more than all the other medicine concepts I had to deal with as a hospitalist. And this is where I am today. So check that website out if you're interested. 
by no means do you have to know what you want to do with your career. Maybe you have some interests, maybe you just keep an open mind. And if you have some interests, explore them as best as possible with an open mind in case you have something that even strikes your interest even more. Statement number two is the path to becoming a doctor is straightforward and easy to navigate. Also, for majority of people, this is false. In fact, majority of your students are now more and more what we call non-traditional, where you have a path that is not like everyone else's. The typical medical school path, somebody who does a four-year undergraduate degree in something in natural sciences like biology or chemistry or biochemistry, then does four years of medical school and then immediately goes into their three to seven year residency and then starts their first job doing whatever they want to do. For most people, this is not the case, myself included. I did three years of undergrad degree in neuroscience. Then I took a job where I worked as a behavioral therapist with autistic kids because I thought I'd want to do pediatrics. I did four years of medical school. I did three years of residency. I took a job as an internal medicine hospitalist after finishing residency and then went back to cardiology fellowship. Everyone has their own story. And sometimes that leads you to taking a big gap to do other things or build up your application or perhaps even have a different career before you say, I want to become this type of doctor or I want to change specialties or I want to subspecialize even further. It's very, very common. Now, is it easy to navigate? Absolutely not. Because every time you make a decision, there's this fear of if I delay this or if I don't do this now, am I going to be in the best shot? Or if I do this now, am I going to have a competitive enough application? The medical journey definitely puts you at risk of always over you thinking your decisions, not realizing if you're making the right left or right turn. But hindsight being 2020 where I am today, I can tell you for a fact, you likely will end up exactly where you're supposed to be, even though the life may look different than what you were expecting. Statement number three, you will remember your grades. Also 100% false. Yes, you may remember your board scores here and there, but as much stress that you put into that biochem final that may be coming up or the microbiology class you're in or learning all the structures of anatomy, the grades you ultimately get on individual quizzes and tests don't really matter. I've never had a patient ask me what I got in cardiology and medical school to ask me if I'm competent enough to do this or what my board scores were. Sometimes people ask me where I went to medical school or did my residency if they're kind of inclined to what that means. But usually people don't ask you about your credentials. So they assume that your hard work has led you to where you are there. And so with that statement, if you're on your medical journey, remember that yes, your grades are important to keep as much doors of opportunities open to you, but don't stress them after you have the results. If you get a grade you're really proud of, really enjoy it, celebrate it for the moment and move on to the next one. If you get a grade that disappoints you or repeatedly disappoints you, ask what changes you can make. There's tons of videos here on this channel that we made for that exact reason. Tons of free resources that I'll have in the description that you can check out on how to improve your grades. But don't be anchored by those letdowns and those failures, otherwise you're not gonna have the room to see those successes that you ultimately want. But by no means will you remember your grades, so don't overly focus on them for the better or for the worse. Now, similar to the grades, the next statement is that medical school is all about studying and passing exams. This should be 100% false. There are students who make this 100% true, so it's not a myth for them. But if you just focus on passing exams, you fall into the trap of everything we talked about, where you learn everything for particular exams and you forget it. And so ultimately you are the same kind of student and no better physician or clinician than you were before that exam. On the flip side, if you're somebody who understands that every exam, every course, every opportunity helps you personally as well as your future patients, by one, perhaps it teaches you something about a field that makes you actually want to go into it. I still remember the first lecture I got in cardiology. I'm saying, that's freaking awesome. I want to explore that more. And here I am. And I actually want to be doing that as a career. On the flip side, maybe you learn something that just sticks with you. Maybe you had a great analogy, a great image, a great professor who taught it to you, a great video that you watched, but it stays with you. If you go with intention that I would like to ideally have the goal that if I'm going to learn this, I'm going to learn this forever. Not always the case, but if it sticks with you and you can use that to help your patients in the future, you are significantly a better physician and clinician and care provider for that person that needs you at that moment to ideally memorize or know that information. So again, by no means will you know everything in medical school, but you go in with the intention that every time you open a textbook, every time you go in for a lecture, that there is information that could be presented to you that could at least strike interest for you or improve a patient's care. You look at it much differently. Yes, you have to pass exam. Yes, you should still try to memorize it to do well in the exam, but that's by no means the end goal. Know it, then understand it, so that way you can apply it later. And that should be the spectrum and the goal that you should do throughout medical school. It definitely made the experience much more enjoyable for me. There are things in medical school I remember because of that aspect. And the final statement that we'll break down is that all doctors work in hospitals and in clinics. Now for the majority of physicians, this is actually true, but there are certain physicians where this is not the case because there are fields in medicine for being a doctor where you don't actually have to take care of patients through a hospital or a clinic system. Maybe you do telemedicine. Maybe you work with consulting where instead of taking care of patients individually, you're using your expertise 
expertise of that field that you're working in to actually give insight to a company that may be designing a product. There are tons of ways. Perhaps you can be a physician who is very focused on medical research. Perhaps the majority of your time is spent in the lab doing studies on the next medication that may come out or the next treatment modality. So you may not be taking care of patients directly in a hospital or clinic, but you're using your expertise that you've learned in medical school and perhaps in residencies to best provide patients care. But that, my friends, is a big breakdown of the biggest myths and misconceptions of the medical journey. And if you enjoyed this, then you'll probably enjoy one of our free resources. One of the ones that should be live as I'm making of this video is our med school playbook, where I break down all of the biggest elements that you need to just crush it on medical school, including how to study better, how to manage your time, and all the big elements, as well as the best resources for every phase of the journey. If you want that for absolutely free, I will link that down below in the description. And if you enjoyed this video, support the channel by hitting that like and subscribe button. And if you enjoyed this video, then check out all the study strategies I use to get a 3.9 GPA in medical school, as well as this video right here that has been viewed by a million plus people. As always, my friends, thank you so much for being a part of my journey. Hopefully I was a little help to you guys on yours. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.